Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hi, and welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Rachel Dezombach. I am Digital Transformation Lead in the SEI's Emerging Technology Center. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Carol Smith, to discuss how to determine if your organization is AI ready and how to make sure that you're putting things in process to become AI ready as an organization. Carol, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Why don't we start off by telling the audience a little bit about ourselves and the work that we do here at the SEI. I can start uh, just to make it a little bit easier. So as I said, my name is Rachel Dezombach. My background is in engineering systems and human-centered design. Before joining the SEI, I was an innovation fellow at UC Berkeley, where I helped to grow and define the field of development engineering. Here, I am helping our partners think about what is needed from an organizational standpoint to adopt new technologies, as well as leading the SEI's, uh, helping to lead the SEI's effort around AI engineering, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about today. So very excited for this conversation here with you today, Carol. Excellent. I'm Carol Smith. I uh, am here at the uh, Software Engineering Institute as well in the Emerging Technology Center. And my focus is on looking at humans and machines. Um, so I'm a senior research scientist working on human-machine interaction. And my background is in human-computer interaction, um, where I have a master's degree. And I've been working in this field for 20 years. And since 2015, I've been working on artificial intelligence and autonomous uh, vehicles and other types of emerging technologies and really looking at that human experience, the user experience, and doing research to improve those situations. Excellent, thanks, Carol. And you bring so much uh, experience to the table and have worked in many different types of organizations. So I think it'll be a great conversation today about really what goes in from an organizational standpoint into getting ready to adopt and enable AI systems. So first off, I think we should define a little bit about what we mean when we talk about AI ready in the context of today's environments and the organizations that we work with. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what are some of the hallmark traits of an AI ready organization? Yeah, so those organizations really need to first understand the problems that AI can solve and look at it from that perspective to make sure that they are actually approaching a, a problem that's solvable um, with those systems. And then that next step is really identifying data, making sure that they have the, um, the information that would be needed to build this type of system. And then looking at the people, of course, and figuring out what people they have, what uh, resources they have, the skills that are needed in order to make this system uh, system of realization or the partners that they can bring into the organization to help them to be supported in the, their approach to uh, making AI systems. Great. Thanks for that. One of the things you really highlighted in your answer there, Carol, was about that it's not a, a binary that you're magically AI ready or you're not, that you it's more of a journey, that you're starting from you know, problem definition to organizing your data to starting to experiment and prototype some AI systems all the way up to implementation. And you need different people and, and uh, organizational structures along that journey. I'm curious from your perspective, you know, we talk about AI being this now pervasive technology, but do you have a pulse on where you think most organizations are today in that journey of becoming AI ready? Yeah, I think many organizations are very curious and interested in these technologies. And I see lots of them trying out new things and trying out uh, solutions for the more common uh, problems. Um, but I do think that most organizations are still at those early stages and really trying to understand what these systems can do. Um, the, the AI systems themselves are very um, early in development and effectiveness. And so that also factors into how useful they can even be once they're instituted. Um, probably the, the most helpful um, ways I see AI working right now are in the simpler chatbot type solutions, um, certainly in um, analysis and then looking at um, connections between pieces of information, things like that, where both the problem is very clearly defined and the amount of data that's needed is available and is, is there and, and usable, uh, and, and that those systems are, are really good uh, systems for AI to solve, that, that there's nice patterns to follow, that sort of thing. 
Absolutely. I think something we, I know, talk a lot about is this mismatch between people's expectations of where the technology is today and the applications they want to use AI for. And so I imagine a big challenge that a lot of companies have today is just unpacking where are they actually and being honest with themselves? Where are they in their organizational readiness? Where's the technology and its organizational readiness as well to, to make sure that there's alignment between those two sides of things? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And one of the reasons we're having this conversation is because we know through our work in AI engineering that having systems in place to support AI's development and adoption is critical. It just can't be a system like you purchase a cell phone for an, from the Apple store and you're ready to go. You really need to be paying attention to how you're develop, designing, developing, and implementing AI systems. And you know, it relates to our work in AI engineering. For those that aren't familiar, AI engineering is a field of research and practice that integrates the principles of software engineering, systems, computer science, and human-centered design to create AI systems in accordance with human needs for mission outcomes. And that field of AI engineering that we're trying to grow and, and spark conversation around is about exactly this, that it's not just the technology itself, it's the implementation of it and what that looks like. And that's very critical to pay attention to. And I, I feel like it's it's worth kind of starting, keeping this conversation grounded in what's different about implementing AI versus other software solutions. That goes back to that long-term uh, issue that you brought up earlier with the maintenance uh, piece, the, the fact that the maintenance probably isn't even the best term, but that these, these systems aren't ones that you can set and forget. These aren't systems that um, simply are installed and maintain themselves over periods of time. Rather, they are in a constant state of change because new data needs to be added to them. Once that new data is added, the actual uh, system will change and be affected by that, and that may significantly affect the results that are uh, that are made or the recommendations that a system might make. Uh, another um, big difference is just the amount of, of infrastructure that's needed, the types of systems that are needed um, to maintain uh, the, the uh, speed at which people want these systems to work. There needs to be a lot of computing power um, behind them. And then also just maintaining a system that is robust, that's secure, that, that has the uh, the trust because of its uh, ability to respond in a timely manner, that, that sort of thing. Those types of um, activities require people who know how to uh, continue to tweak and maintain the, the system. And so there's a lot of um, ongoing uh, and scaling that needs to occur within the organization to keep these uh, systems healthy and uh, maintained. So it's almost as if the organization needs to be growing, adapting, evolving, right in parallel with the way that the system is growing, adapting, evolving over time. And it sounds like from what you're saying, most organizations are, are focused on the technology's evolution and less about their own scale uh, on the workforce side to accommodate that. Yeah, I think in a lot of cases, people uh, make the assumption that an AI system is actually going to reduce the work. And what instead it can do is augment. Certainly, uh, certain uh, activities can be simplified, sped up, uh, and those individuals' uh, jobs may change dramatically. But it also means that in other individuals need to pick up more work uh, and do more maintenance, do more um, maintaining of the data um, and the system architecture, all, all those sorts of things. Those skills are in more um, need as these systems uh, continue to uh, grow and, and be used. Yeah, and especially short term, there's a huge in investment, both in terms of money, people that needs to go into getting it to a place where it's even ready to be operationalized in some way, shape or form. Yeah, most of these systems take months uh, to, to build, weeks to months at least. Um, and for highly um, specific and broad, broader sets of information or, or problems that need to be solved, they can take even longer. And that, that in itself is a big commitment um, when potentially uh, adding more people may solve the same problem much more quickly and at much lower cost. Interesting. So on that note, you know, you had spoken earlier about the triaging that's necessary for organizations to do to really reflect on, is this a problem that's important to me? And is this problem one that makes sense for AI to solve instead of having, as you just said, hiring additional people and have them address that challenge as opposed to kind of task shifting it over to technology. So when you think about implementing AI in organizations, how do you approach identifying problems that can be solved using AI? 
The first question is about data. It should be about data anyway. Really looking to see that that um, data is in existence, is accessible, is something that the organization has control of and, and access to, making sure that it's the right data, that uh, that it is not overly biased in one direction or another with regard to what they're actually trying to do. Um, and then uh, thinking through also the implications of the system. Uh, is putting the system together, is bringing these sets of data together going to put uh, people at risk um, in a variety of different ways and really being imaginative about those kinds of implications as well. Um, so, so lots of early thinking before any programming, any algorithms are, are put together, really looking at that to see if, if the initial pieces are there. And then once we are assured that the data and the, the problem is, is the right one and, and everything is in place from that point of view, then it's do we have the people who can actually build the product uh, available? And uh, how do we match them with potentially the subject matter experts that, that are needed to be able to ensure that the system is giving the right information back and that it's answering questions in the right way, whatever that topic area is, um, and continuing along thinking through um, the actual building of it, are we building it for the right people? Uh, are the people who are going to be using the system going to uh, understand the system? Are they going to be able to um, use it in a way that really is going to augment their work and make uh, make their lives easier, hopefully, and, uh, and protect them as well as the people who might be affected by the system? I really love the comments you made about the hard conversations that need to happen up front. You know, in organizing your data, really questioning is in what ways is our data biased, not is our data biased, because we know that all data is biased in some way. And questions about the user of are we building it for the right people, as well as questions about unintended consequences. And we know from our experience that a lot of times those conversations are skipped, that people jump right into the building instead of kind of doing that upfront work. And I'm curious from your perspective, why do you think that is? Yeah, I, I think part of it is just enthusiasm. People are really excited. Uh, AI seems like it's it's the utopian. It, it's you know it's going to fix things. Um, we won't have to worry about the 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 bias or the problems that we're having because the AI will fix it. But unfortunately, it just doesn't do uh, those types of things. AI can't solve people problems. It can't solve social problems. We have to do that work ourselves. Um, and it also can't fix problems in the data specifically. Um, that then that's why those critical questions, those, those uh, difficult conversations, the, the really hard um, and, and sometimes really unpleasant conversations have to occur early so that you don't uh, unintentionally build something that is really um, hugely problematic and a waste of money too and time, um, but rather thinking through ahead of time to make sure that, that you are building the right thing for the right reasons. Absolutely. And so, so much of that is dependent on, is there psychological safety in the organization to facilitate those conversations? Are there people that are in roles that know how to facilitate those hard conversations. And, and we know that often that is overlooked or taken for granted in organizations, but something that is just so critical for success. Right, on this, right. Oh. On this notion of, oh, sorry, did you have I, I was just going to add to that. Oh, go for it. Right. And, and along that same line, having a diverse group of people who are going to come at the problem in different ways with different ideas and different experiences, bringing people with not only different skill sets, but, but literally different education uh, experiences, different different life experiences, and bringing them all together is is a, t a point at which you need to have a set of ethics to to guide them to bring them together on the same at the same point and from the same perspective but also making sure as you mentioned that psychological safety is there so that they do feel that they can be themselves that they can ask tough questions that they are not going to be seen as challenging in a negative way but rather doing the right thing asking the the questions up front um making good trouble, if you will, and, and doing the things that are needed to be done to make really good software. But that does require leadership to be in place that is supportive of that work and, and ideally that is diverse itself and that can reflect the diversity of the workforce um, and so that they stay around. Uh, retention is a big problem in technology in general and certainly with a more diverse uh, workforce, you're gonna have even more challenges there. And so having that leadership available um, and visible is, is really important. Absolutely. I, I love all of what you just said. And I, I think something that's really important, too, is that going back to our conversation about 
what types of problems you're going to apply AI to. That diversity is so important always and particularly important when you're working on higher stakes applications for AI. I think a lot of us forget that these technologies were developed for a lot of low stakes applications, things like uh, recommending where I should get my lunch from. If that decision goes poorly, you know, it, it's a bummer, but it's not necessarily going to affect human outcomes, or at least not on the surface. And as we're getting into these higher stakes applications, as organizations are starting to look at new areas where they can apply AI, all that diversity is even more critical to make sure you're able to imagine the full scope of possibilities. So something that you brought up earlier was that the starting place for organizations when they're really thinking about implementing AI is getting their, their mind around the data and thinking clearly about what do they need to do to collect data, organize data. And I'm curious from your perspective, have you seen any strategies implemented that really set organizations up for success when they think about data? Yeah, so certainly understanding that problem, understanding the people who are needing to use that data, understanding where they're coming from and the types of questions they're going to be asking about that data or the types of recommendations that they're going to need, um, how they're going to be in a, interacting with that system and using what it is created from that system is really key and, and does take a, a significant um, investment in that learning. But it, pays dividends when it comes to the solution, because if you build the right thing, then the people will use it. They are more likely to trust it because it, it is providing them with the information that they that they expect. And along with that uh, comes their um, viewing that data in, in as early a stage as possible and making sure that really that is the right data, having subject matter experts confirm the, uh, the um, I can't think of the word, Having uh, the subject matter experts really look at the source of the data and confirm that it is uh, the best possible uh, source, or at least the, the the accuracy is there that they would expect. In many ways, what you're saying is also broadening the notion of what data is worth collecting, that it's collecting the data, the kind of the set of examples that you're going to use to train the system, but also the qualitative data of what it actually looks like in practice to make the decision or achieve the outcome that you're wanting to achieve and investing in both sides of that to make sure that you're built, you're collecting both in parallel. So to change directions a little bit, the recent DOD artificial intelligence strategy announced the goal of an AI ready force stating that AI is poised to transform every industry and is expected to impact every corner of the department, spanning operations, training, sustainment, force protection, goes on and on. And Carol, your work has shown that for the DOD to succeed in AI implementation, new skills and new roles are needed. Could you talk a little bit about your concept of the curiosity expert and what that looks like? Yeah, sure. These are the individuals who really are focused on understanding people and problems. It's not that everyone else isn't curious, but rather that these are the individuals whose job it is to really focus on those areas and to really look at what is the individual's uh, situation, what are the needs that they have, and how can the system potentially meet those needs. So these people tend to have backgrounds such as I do in user experience, human computer interaction. Um, some of them are cognitive psychologists or digital anthropologists. But the point is that they really are thinking about how the system is going to be used, how the system is going to work in relation to other people, um, looking at human machine teaming, for example, when it comes to robotics and, and other types of systems uh, where a human it may do part of the work and the system may do the other part of the work. And how are they partnering together? What kind of information does uh, each of them have? And how can you build the system in a way that makes it trustworthy, not not really trusting, but, but rather um, appropriately trustworthy, and that the uh, people using the system find it to be helpful and that, and that they're going to accept the system and use the system um, as it's intended versus uh, rejecting the system for a variety of reasons. Something I love about the notion of the curiosity expert is also that it's defined broadly, that that work can be done by people under multiple different roles or different types of training. And I think that also helps the DOD because it's not just you have to hire one very specific type of person, but it's about looking to the workforce, looking to applicants and saying, who can do this work, but not losing sight of what the true need is to unpack what are humans' experiences, what outcomes do they want to have, and, and how they the different ways you might be able to get there. 
And I'm curious from your perspective, what need, what linkages need to be in place between the curiosity experts who are doing that user-focused work and the development team that's building the system, writing the code, trying to instantiate it? How do you make sure that there's connection between those sides and is it necessary to have? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely necessary for, for them all to be working together and to all understand the problem that they're solving so that they really are working towards the same goals. Um, part of this is really having these people be embedded uh, in the team, at least uh, on a partial basis. So um, sharing the information that they learn, having uh, some of the machine learning experts and system architects, whoever else is on the team, uh, observe the the research um, so that they understand what is, what is being done and the types of questions that are being asked and also seeing the responses from those uh, those end users. Uh, another great activity is uh, usability testing of early prototypes. So d making an early prototype of an AI system is difficult, but it is doable. And uh, creating that system in such a way that it can be tested by uh, the individuals who will end up using it and having the people who are actually building the system observe those sessions as well is extremely helpful and, and can build um, a sense of sympathy, maybe even empathy um, for the way that they uh, may, may struggle using the system and the types of questions they're asking, the types of information that they don't see um, the system providing, and, and hopefully um, that leading to improvements in the system. So even if you're not a curiosity expert or haven't been trained in HCI, say I'm, I'm a developer, that if I can just over observe that research happening, it can shift how I see the development and inform design, de design, design decisions down the road as well. Definitely, definitely. And, and there's some techniques that, that anyone can try. Um, certainly someone who's trained in this area is going to do a better job and, and get more um, effective and impactful results. But um, certainly anyone who is interested should be going out and understanding the users and, and not doing, um, not just showing the work that they're doing, but rather listening and observing and asking questions to understand the other individual's experience so that they're not just building what they think should be built, um, but rather what, what is needed by the person who'll be using it. Absolutely. And I, I love that notion that it's not just up to the curiosity experts and there's no magic skill set that they have, but it's really that Everyone, you know, certainly there's things you can learn from people who've been deeply trained in it, but it can be, it's accessible to everyone to just go and ask kind of what types of problems do you have? How are you looking to use this to grow their familiarity with, with the users themselves? As we look ahead and think about implementation of AI across the DoD, what do you think people aren't thinking enough about? Where do you see kind of existing gaps in conversation about AI implementation? Yeah, certainly that, that long-term piece, the, the idea that these systems need to be monitored, the human needs to be in the loop uh, and responsible for the decisions, the recommendations that these systems are making. I, I don't think that that is uh, being, it's cer certainly being talked about more, um, but I think that that's not something that's always understood initially when people are thinking about making an AI system. I, and often I think people uh, assume or hope that an AI system is going to stand alone and, and, and be responsible for itself, but systems don't have rights and responsibilities and uh, giving that kind of responsibility to an AI system is wrong. Um, a human really needs to be responsible, particularly for you know significant decisions, any significant decision that would affect a human's life, their um, well-being, their, um, their way of earning money, anything along those lines certainly should be a situation where a human is, a single human, um, is responsible for uh, those types of decisions that the AI system might make. And it's really then for the workforce shifting their mindset from kind of a linear mindset of if I do X, Y will happen to being open to there being emergent effects also that, you know, we don't actually, we ha can predict uh, most of what will happen, but we always need to be looking for unexpected consequences or other outcomes that could emerge from the system itself. I think that mindset shift is really hard for a lot of people and a major challenge to growing this AI ready workforce as well to start thinking about, okay, how do I just get into a place of anticipating those outcomes? Yeah, yeah. And part of the challenge also is building the systems in a way where uh, 
if there is an unexpected result, it's uh, it's explained, that it's uh, clear what happened, that there is a, an obvious way for someone to investigate that more fully. It may not be the end user. It may be something that, that someone with more uh, machine learning knowledge or, or something along those lines needs to look into, but it should be Oh, there should be ways to find that information out. And I, people uh, continuously use terms that indicate that these systems are somehow magical and that they can't control them. Uh, and that is uh, not the way the system should be built. They need to be built with that, that idea of responsibility as well with regard to what might happen. And if you're not sure what's happening, that, that you need to take responsibility for that and, uh, and make sure that that's maintained in a way that people do then understand what's going on or the system is shut down if if it's not being reliable. Absolutely. You know, so much of what is talked about is, oh, the system's opaque and I have no control over that. It's just the way it is. And I think a lot of what our work has shown is that that's just insufficient for high stakes applications. And if it's the case, then it's not going to be adopted. And so starting, if we can let go of that a little bit, we can start to challenge ourselves to say, how do we develop systems that are transparent, that I can find the off switch for and not just say, I have no control, therefore this is going to happen no matter what. So let's look to transition. If I am leading an effort to adopt AI within my organization, are there any go-to resources that you would recommend starting with? Yeah, there's some wonderful resources out there. There are um, papers such as data sheets for data sets and model cards for models that really help people to think through the types of questions they should be asking about the data, the provenance of the data, the way the data was collected, the uh, the breadth of it, and really starting that work to look at the information that they're putting together in a better way. The model cards uh, it, are very similar in that they have you really asking very specific questions about the work work that's going to be done to build this AI system and, and how that uh, those decisions are being made and what the end goal is for that work. Um, there are also sets of ethics that I feel are very important to help align uh, various uh, people from different uh, backgrounds, people with different experiences, bringing them all together on a set of ethics. And there uh, are checklists, including the, the checklist that we'll link to um, from this podcast that, um, that I developed that really support that work. Um, often the sets of ethics may be very vague and need uh, some, the people using them need some support in order to really be able to uh, enact them, to be able to apply them to the problem that they're trying to solve. And so by using these types of tools, you can begin having those really uh, important conversations, the critical conversations that are going to lead to better work. Um, a lot of this really is just opening up that uh, that communication line, making sure that people are actually talking about the work that they're doing, not just the uh, the typing, but rather the intent, the work that they're trying to do and the effect that it will have on the world, because these AI systems are just so much more powerful, bring together so many different types of data and potentially can affect so many more people. We need to be more critical about the work and take responsibility for those conversations and the, and the, out, the work that, that they create. Absolutely. I, I love your notion on the resources being a support tool to start critical lines of conversation. The other ones that you made me think of are there's some great resources available on just the basics of design and systems thinking that I think are super accessible. And if you have teammates that or you're trying to start AI and people are super focused on the solution, not on the problem space as much, or the unintended consequences that Carol was really talking about, I think just gaining some language and familiarity with those two fields can really help people to understand why it's necessary to do that upfront work, why you need to be reflective of the ethics, the, the questions in your data sets, the questions in your model, why you need to be interrogating those upfront. And so we can link a couple of resources there as well. The mindset that people have as they're approaching these problems is the key. Really being curious, being speculative about the potential uh, dangers that could occur, and, and really thinking thoroughly about the work that they're doing. Absolutely. Well, with that, I want to thank you so much, Carol, for being here with me today and engaging in this conversation. And to our listeners, thank you for joining. We will include links in our transcript to all resources mentioned in this podcast. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions, either to Carol and I or to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. 
This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.